Captain Ali, 4,000 feet, uh, speed uh, 180 knots, one double jingle. Hello, welcome to this episode of Cockpits and Cocktails. We have a really fun episode this time with um, Kim Metris. Kim was actually a winner of the Fly Girl Scholarship last year, and I invited her on the show and wanted her to meet with uh, Alyssa and I, I guess, meet virtually over the um, over Skype so we could talk to her about what she's been doing, what she's been able to do since I awarded the scholarship to her through Fly Girl. Kim was drawn into aviation while she was living in South Africa working as an aerial survey biologist and they would fly around in a Cessna 172. Now she wasn't flying, she was a passenger doing this other work, biology work, but she was very intrigued with flying and got really interested in it then. When she came back to the States, she works as a professor, college professor. She decided to get her pilot's license. She got her private pilot's license and then her instrument rating and her commercial rating. And during all that, she decided to learn to fly a tailwheel airplane and did some aerobatics. And her heart is really interested in instructing aerobatics and tailwheel flying. She lives in Greenville, South Carolina. Her husband is a pilot, and he's French, so we were able to speak a little Francais, because I took French in high school, <laughs> so I thought I'd practice on him a little bit, and I spent some time in France, too, so I was, that was kind of fun. Um, her and her husband would love to one day run an FBO and instruct tailwheel and aerobatics, so I'm really excited to introduce her to you on this episode of Cockpits and Cocktails with Fly Alyssa and myself, Natalie Fly Girl Kelly. Okay, so this is Kimberly. Kimberly um, won one of my scholarships, and um, so I've given away three, and you were my second winner. Um, and I thought you'd be, you, you kind of had a cool story and background, and I thought you'd be a good person to, to talk to because it's not necessarily like the traditional um, aviator path. So I thought um, you have a really good, interesting story, and I want to hear what you're up to lately because I haven't talked to you in a while. And um, just introduce yourself and tell us how you got started in aviation. Okay. Uh, so I'm Kimberly Metris. I did not grow up in an aviation family at all. No one in my family flies. In fact, my, my, I'm an only child as well. My parents, when they heard that I was going to fly were, um, a little uneasy about that in general. So I, uh, after college, I moved to South Africa and I was doing research in South Africa and Zimbabwe. And to get to my field sites, I needed little airplanes. And I had never been on a small aircraft before. You know, yes, our airliners, of course, many people have, but, uh, you know, not a Cessna 206 or uh, a helicopter to do the work that I needed to do there. And that fascinated me. Uh, my role then was a biologist. So I was the wildlife biologist on the project, but I was always observing the pilots and they were so cool. They were so badass. And I admired that. And I could tell that they also knew something about the wildlife, their behavior with herding the animals using the aircraft. It, it just fascinated me. And so when I eventually came back to the States, I started a PhD program because that was sort of the next step in what I had been studying, which was biology. And, and my New Year's resolution for 2013, so we're going back seven years ago, I was going to take a flight and I was going to learn how to fly an airplane. And you should know this was out of the blue. I had not said anything at all. My parents were away on the coast. 
And I called them and said, hey, I'm getting a Groupon. I'm going to go take a flight. And they were like, yeah, let us know how that goes. Um, so later that year, I soloed. That was 2013. I earned my private in 2014 while continuing as a grad student in the wow. PhD program. And that flying was my saving grace because the, the science, it's a lot. And I think sometimes in academia, they reward um, overworking and mm. that's sort of seen as a, a badge of honor, being a workaholic. So having the balance of being able to go fly and having to drop everything on the ground and totally disregard it because as you both know, when we're in the air, that's all we should care about, you know? And that was one of the only things that could make me forget everything on the ground and all of that stress and everything that went along with that. And I felt free. And I also felt just as badass as those wildlife pilots I, I was with, you know, back in Africa. So um, I ended up finishing my private in 2014. And my ta I got my tail wheel right after. And props to Natalie for getting your tail wheel. Yay! <laughs> yeah, so we're all tail wheel pilots here. Yay! Yeah. 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 I love it that Alyssa what tail wheels have you flown um so I got my license I got my um endorsement in a Cetabria is what did yeah. you guys get yours in a cub a cub and I also earned mine in a Cetabria as well that's awesome so yeah. the Cetabria is like something I absolutely love because it's like you could totally do a little bit of backcountry and some aerobatics and just so many things it's like so versatile and the cub as well is awesome yeah, um, but I just want to say that like you're amazing me with your South African stories and like I yeah. mean I think that would be so amazing. Why don't we all three move? We'll go to South <laughs> Africa and we can do backcountry flying to safaris. Like how cool! That sounds amazing. I, I, I would be on that in a second. That's incredible. Um, that really opened my eyes when I once I got my private and. My flight instructor sort of said, okay, once you get your private, I'll put you in a real airplane. And uh, so I earned my tailwheel in his Tabria. We did aerobatics. And now after every aerobatic flight, I was giddy. I was just like, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. How do you even stop smiling after that? Like Exactly. And, but I, you know, there's nothing that can prepare you for how exhilarating aerobatics is until you actually have the opportunity to do that. Um, so that was 2014. Uh, I finished my PhD in 2015 and flew a little bit, but as we like to say, life got in the way, which for me was work. In 2016, I didn't fly. I, you know, finishing the PhD, you always, or I don't know, I thought that I should continue with what I've invested my time in and pursue the science. And there was always that nagging in the back of my head, no, I want to be flying. And um, that nagging also came in the form of my now husband, who I met when I just finished my private. He was an instrument student at the same airport. So he was always encouraging me to keep flying. And so in... 2016, we bought a little airplane. We bought a Cessna 140. So it's a two-seater tail dragger. So cool. Nice. And that's a, it's, it was a challenge uh, for not flying for a while. And then transitioning from a Cetabria to a 140, all tail wheels fly very differently. They have mm -hmm. hand, handling characteristics and and seeing that, um, and you know, there are different techniques even to flying tailwheel and, you know, getting that, getting wheel landings down, it was, it's all, it's still a challenge. I, I have, you know, not an inconsequential number of hours in tailwheels and I'm still challenged a lot. And I, I like think it's always, I think with tailwheel, it's always going to keep you learning. You're always moving your feet. It's like tap dancing, you know, it's like, <laughs> You're always on the pedals and still like I'm taxiing or doing something. And I'm like, ah, 
oh, what's going on? You know, it's like, I really know how to fly these. Like, how is this even possible sometimes? Like, <laughs> That's a really good analogy because uh, one of my instructors, he taught it to me as the checking technique to keep that differential pressure. And it is like tap dancing. I, I really like that comparison. <laughs> okay, so tell me what made you decide to buy an airplane? Mostly my husband. <laughs> um, Great <he> husband. <laughs> I know. I, I did pick a good one. Um, he he grew up in France, and oh. he could fly an airplane before he could drive a car. Jeremy, I feel like you need to come in here for a minute. Um, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> he, so parlez-vous français? <laughs> oh, my gosh. She's ready to speak French with you now. <laughs> say hey. Um, I know a little bit. Like, uh, I took French in high school, but I definitely, and I spent about a month, I speak, like, a lot. Hello. (laughs) How are you? How are you guys doing? Your hair looks good. Yeah, just like, like I'm losing my hair right here, Yeah, I'm a hairstylist. Mine's all fake. We can do this. It's fine. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Okay. So y'all bought an airplane because. Yeah, we did. I really um, wanted to buy an airplane. Yeah, I think that was one of your dreams. One of my husband's dreams since he was young to own an airplane. Yeah, at first we wanted something bigger, but realized that no, it's too expensive. Yeah. Like a so, 185 or something even bigger, but it's also harder to handle for us right now. Yeah, so the flight instructor that got us really into tailwheel um, told us, hey, one of my students said in the 140, you want to buy it? And we're like, oh, maybe. So took a test flight and we bought it and it's ours now and it's the best airplane ever. Nice, nice. Is that, a, is that a chart behind you, an aeronautical chart behind you? Oh, all goodness, do you know that's actually a chart from France. Uh, you have to take cool. it off the wall. <laughs> oh my gosh! Look at that. So, so that's yeah, hilarious. Is that where you were? Your airport right there? Yeah, yeah that's where he's yeah. from. Wow, that's so cool. I class G. Yeah. So funny. What? How old were you when you started flying? The first flight. The the first time I went in a light airplane, I was fourteen years old. Okay. And the reason why I ended up there is because at the end of middle school, you have to go do a work experience for a week. And I actually went to the control tower in Le Mans. And my first flight instructor was fueling the airplane. And the lady that was uh, at the control tower taking care of me, basically babysitting me, uh, called him up on the radio and said, hey, can you take someone else? And he was like, absolutely. So I went in there and I was, uh, I was, yeah, I was 14 years old at the, I don't remember what year. And a year later, when I was 15, I went back to that flight school and basically started flight lesson at 15 soloed at that time got my license that allows you to fly 30 kilometers around the airport alone mm-hmm. and did that at 15 and then I had to wait until I was 17 to get my private and did that and then flew a little bit after that once in a while and then um, it got way too expensive got an opportunity to move to the US and there you go. So. <laughs> Amazing. That's so awesome. <laughs> and he, he learned to fly in a tailwheel. So oh, yeah. That's, okay. you know, I'm working on CFI right now. As Natalie, you're probably finishing up with that, too. And, Alyssa, I don't know if you're – where are you, Alyssa, in your training? Bye. So I'm uh, working on yeah. – He I'm says bye. On, bye. Um, so I'm working on commercial and kind of IFR, kind of together, just making sure I hit all the requirements. Um, I'm at like 230 hours or so now. Right. Um, I've just kind of hit that lull where I need to start studying hardcore for all the written stuff. But um, 
you know, I didn't start this until I was 29 years old. And I don't know what age you were at 2013. But I mean, it's awesome that he started at 14. I started at 29. And everybody can start it at a different age. But yet, we're also com- like community driven with aviation. And it's like, our stories are so different, but we're so connected somehow. And that that's what excites me, like meeting people like you. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's true. And I can appreciate that because I started flying when I was 27. And that was I was a student pilot at 27. And I felt when I realized that that's probably what I wanted to do, at least for one of my jobs in my lifetime or one of my careers, I felt really behind because I saw people like I hadn't met my husband at the time, but I saw people like him or, you know, that would finish and get all of their ratings and be in their early 20s at an airline. Mm -hmm. And I felt, wow, I'm really behind, but I was never introduced to this as a possible career no one you know no family exposure it just happened that you know when I was in Africa I was had that opportunity okay so tell me okay you got into it and your parents weren't like I mean I guess you wouldn't say they weren't supportive but they just weren't like really sure what you were doing exactly (laughs) yeah my um I I had it the site pick, let's say this, the site picture for a landing didn't come easily to me with my first instructor. And when I expressed that to my family, their first thought or contribution was, well, maybe you're not meant for this. Mm. And that struck a chord. It yeah. was my personality. That means I'm going to do it that much harder. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. know? Um, so having that drive, but I felt behind and I mentioned that to my instructor mentor, who's one of whom, which is getting me through my CFI shout out to Harrison Smith. Um, but he said, you know, I, he Harrison. started, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> at 27 and, okay. you know, he was someone that I looked up to and that sort of, you, it helps to see someone who's at least you can see yourself and someone else or parts of yourself and someone else so that it's almost that path and hey maybe I can do this and I'm not that far behind and it's okay to keep going mm-hmm. yeah okay so one of the things I think that um when I was going through the scholarship applications what mm-hmm. appealed to me about you and your story I guess was well you weren't straight out of college and I think I understand the challenges of kind of like a career changer and what that's like mm-hmm. to shift gears and um, some of the challenges that, that you'll face with family and friends and, you know, and questioning yourself probably since you'd gone through all this school for some something else. And it was like, what am I doing? Feeling that pull towards aviation. And then the other thing was I really liked how you didn't really have a traditional kind of idea of what you wanted to do. Like you weren't like, I'm going to be an airline pilot. You had these other things that you kind of wanted to do, you know, with the aerobatics and all that. So talk a little bit about what your ultimate goal would be in aviation. Yeah. So, so there's a website that's out there and it's called oddballpilot.com. And if you haven't visited it, you should. Uh, I am, I am of of a very, unconventional nature and the airline life doesn't appeal to me it doesn't fit in my personality it's great for many people but I think uh, a key for for us is to figure out what drives us and where our passions are mm-hmm. and so my sort of unconventional goals I do want to instruct not necessarily as a means to an end because um I am, I'm a teacher by trade. I, you know, I ended up taking a job as a lecturer at the local university uh, in the middle of last year because, hey, my degree allows me to do that and I love to teach. But that's what I do. That is part of who I am. So being an instructor is sort of um, a way that I can use my teaching skills. So I'm looking forward to being an instructor. Mm-hmm. I, like we've talked about tail wheel, that is one of my passions and so is aerobatics. And I want to 
be someone that can mentor people through that as well, because I know the the skills that it can provide and also how much fun it is. Mm-hmm. So, so that's a goal of mine. And then my experience, whether it's been in Colorado working with wildlife or Africa or around here even, because I used to work for the Department of Natural Resources and I flew some with their chief pilot as well, would be um, to do backcountry type flying, um, you know, flying hunters out to remote locations or researchers out to remote locations. It would be really cool to fly out in Antarctica. I don't know if that would ever be possible, but <laughs> one of those bucket list goals. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That yeah. sounds so fun. I love I'm that you had these say, big like, ideas. You're just such a boss, babe. And like, I love <laughs> that you, this wasn't your path and that yeah. you embrace it within your career. Because I feel like somebody think most people think like you have to be airline or you have to be a biologist or you have to be something so set. But that's the amazing thing about aviation and what I want to like bring to people with this podcast is yeah. that I think there's room for everyone. Like aviation is for everybody, whether it be you teaching, whether it be um, aerobatics or backcountry or float flying, or maybe you want to do sales or ferrying or any of those kind of jobs. Um, I think we're both kind of the same person in that like we don't want to work airlines. I want to be personal with everybody. I want to know my customer. I want to know who's in my airplane. I want to make that experience perfect for them. And I don't want to be an instructor just because I'm I'm not that teacher. I think it'd be a cool like give back. But I honestly think like if I had 200 passengers, like you would have no real connection with them. So you know, it's like, yeah, I love that interaction. And that's kind of just my personality. And I love that you're bridging your gap. And like, that'd be really cool for you to be flying backcountry to like, bear, you know, locations or, you know, in that, I mean, I could have Air Force One one of these days. You know? That's right. <laughs> that's right. It's true. It's true. Um, you know, teaching is also, it, it calls a lot out of you and it's easy to burn out no matter if you're a kindergarten teacher or you teach at a university. Um, and that we see that a lot with flight instructors as well. Um, you know, we have the industry that generally you're only in flight, flight instructing full time for a certain amount of time. You traditionally move to the airlines. Well, a lot of the CFIs do see uh, quite a bit of burnout. So, that is something where mixing it up with whether it's backcountry charter or ferrying, ferry flights, um, you know, anything of that nature. Yeah. Uh, no. There's so many things you can do and you don't have to be pigeonholed into one thing. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Do you plan to continue teaching at um, the university? I am now. Yes. It, Would it you like to continue well. doing that as long as well as being a CFI or do you kind of want to leave that? But, so I think going sort of going back to what Alyssa mentioned at the beginning of our discussion was that the career you have now pays, you know, more than you would get entry level. For me, say my career pays more than starting as an entry level CFI, even teaching with my aircraft, um, you know, the the bills are going to get paid with the career I have right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, But that is not, there's going to be another time. And, you know, Natalie known some of the financial hurdles that my family, my husband and I have, have endured the last few years. But, um, and so I think this is a blessing, this, this career I have right now, but that's not going to be long-term. This is, it's a great position. I'm essentially a professor on a one-year contract. I'm a lecturer. Mm -hmm. So, it's year to year. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'd like to start my own uh, flight school. And that's still a goal. I'd like to do aerobatics, tailwheel and some backcountry charter. And that's also going to mean more travel then. And that's something both Jeremy and I do want to get back into him mm-hmm. being in France and my having lived in South in Africa. You know, yeah. we, we need to pick it up and not get too comfortable where we are too. Yeah. Need to do. 
So talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned some of the financial issues or struggles that you've had. I think a lot of people do in flight training. Um, yeah. Share, I, share a little bit about what that was. What happened? I am certainly not alone in, in, in that in our financial struggles, starting with, you know, going through my private. I was a graduate student and graduate student stipends. Um, especially in, you know, 2011 through 2015, they're, they're not great. Um, it's, it's close to minimum wage and you're working, you're working a lot if you want to get out, that is. Um, so, so, you know, knowing that needing to fly twice a week is really where you need to go unless you want to backslide. It took a lot of sacrifices and there was no savings, no, in, you know, investing. I still had a student loan that, you know, was not getting paid down the way I would have preferred, you know, things like that. Those are always in the back of your mind, too. Yeah. They don't go away. And yeah. then I decided after um, being a scientist for a while that I was going to completely switch careers and so I left that job and it was a scary thing, but my husband had his and he encouraged me to go ahead, get my instrument rating, get commercial, go through it. We had savings. The week I started flight training, he was let go from his job, workforce reduction. The week mm-hmm. I started. Oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so that was extremely traumatic and it's still traumatic for us to be real um that's just something that we're gonna have to live with our entire lives that whole time and you know people like natalie who were there to reach out and in a way lift us up and sorry oh it's okay (laughs) it's amazing how something can change your life so profoundly and I'm I'm on the same boat. You're gonna make me cry. So you know, <laughs> me too. Like, I don't think any of us are rich by any means. And so that's not how we fly, and that's not how we make it in this aviation community. I think our passion is what drives us into this, and and we lift each other up. And Natalie is kind of amazing. So <laughs> it's it's, oh, oh. it's just thank you, thank you. That I was so glad you. that I was able to do that. I mean, it just seemed like the perfect timing and perfect fit and um, glad that it worked out. It was. And so he, what's really funny about all of this is after um, all was said and done, we ended up, he is back at the job he was at when we met and we're flying. And I am back at the same university where I earned my PhD now teaching. Yeah. Wow. So, and, you know, we're back at the same our same airport haunts where I learned to fly. I'm now flying in, in the right seat of the aircraft. I got my private in. Um, you know, we have our airplane. Yeah. And yeah. things like that, that, um, you know, they're great. I have two instructor mentors, both Harrison, like I mentioned, and Brett, who recently became a DPE. So that mentorship is just fantastic and I really have a strong community not only out there with y'all but but here locally as well which is it's it's so important um I just can't tell you how important it is and I think after everything that happened last year with you know the downs but also those ups and being lifted up and successes so after all that happened I was able to still finish instrument and commercial and work at this job, you know, as a, as an instructor. So that was a lot. And I'm like, you know, I I need to give back and I need to give back more than just writing articles and, and things like that. And so I applied to become a fast team representative and they, they accepted me. So I'll be going to training later this month. And hopefully getting that going. So hopefully I can be a mentor to local pilots around here and sort of give back to the aviation community because, you know, y'all and so many people were there to to lift us up and keep us flying in in the air. That's awesome. uh, Glad to hear that. It amazes me how, like, like, social media has brought everybody so close together in the aviation community and, like, even though I didn't know you, I knew you through Natalie kind of, and 
knew you through different organizations. And it, it amazes me how like Natalie's story makes me want to do better in my own and like give back and, and everybody kind of works in that way. And so yeah. that's, that's something I love as well. And but like, true. is there, is there a time where like, did you just want to get your private or did you know, like you wanted to go like all the way in the beginning? That's a really good question. I think my personality is such that if I'm going to start something, I'm going to go all the way. And I think I've always known Natalie was this way too. Yeah. <laughs> and Alyssa, you as well. Um, I, en- I enjoyed private, uh, but after I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't getting the satisfaction out of my science job, the being in an office and, you know, one with four walls. And hey, I even have the corner office in one of the jobs. <laughs> this is not fulfilling. Like, it's just not fulfilling. And yeah, you want to make a difference and you just want to be excited to to do what you're doing every day. And I honestly, I'm just thankful I found aviation when I did, even though it was a little later than I would have liked. That's something you can't necessarily control. So yeah. I um, I waited a while to get my commercial. And so I didn't go straight on. If I would have gone straight on, I, you know, I would probably have more than that. Um, at this point, it, like I said, it's been seven years since I started flying so I've had time to just enjoy flying, too. And I think that's important. That's why I love aerobatics and tailwheel. And I just did that for a long time and just flew and just got better and went places and bought an airplane and then focused on, all right, I guess I need the instrument rating. I guess it's something I need to do. Yeah. And I love, it. I love flying in clouds now. I love actual and I love shooting an approach down to minimums. And it's so mm-hmm. cool. But I, yeah. know, I love it. I never There's thought something that makes you so <gasps> proud about shooting an approach. And it's like, I am on top of the world. Like I can do this. Like, <laughs> you know, but yeah. yeah, one of, one of my CFIs, the one who got me through most of instrument and commercial Steven, he took his, um, he's actually now with Republic. He just left um, his teaching job. But he was so great. The first time I was in actual was also the first time I shot an approach. And we were going through a cloud. And he said, I want you to remember this moment. You will never feel faster in a 172 as we were. (laughs) (laughs) Here's one of the things that I think is beneficial. Because there are so many um, times when I felt like, oh, I wish I'd started sooner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt like I started so late. But I think the benefit of that is for people that start later is um, I think I'm a little more open to other opportunities. I'm not so like focused on one avenue. It's more about what's going to fulfill me. It's not just like, oh, I got to get a job. I got to do this. It's like, no, what's really going to make me happy? What do I feel drawn to? That kind of lifestyle is really, really important. Not just like having this job security or um but being more open to other possibilities, I think, is something that you really don't experience when you're super young. Yeah. Something that comes later. I was I'm I'm very fulfilled in my career. I, I own a salon. I've done it for 12 years. And wow. I was actually I opened a salon during my private. So, like, I was real broke. Um, <laughs> but I never knew I wanted to become a pilot. Uh, and then it just had kind of happened all of a sudden. And six months later, I was a pilot and oh, wow. crazy. But, you know, when I took my check ride for my private, um, the DP questioned me at the end and he's like, so what's next? And I said, I don't know. I just want to fly. And he's <laughs> like, wait, so you're not going to like keep training. And I was like, well, I never thought about it. And I didn't know anybody in aviation. I, I hadn't ventured out of my airport. I knew nobody. I had never been to an air show. I had never seen aerobatics. I had never seen any of this. So then when I did, I was like, peace out. I've got to do all of it. (laughs) You know, here's all my money. Take it. I don't know. You know, and it's, and it's, it's like Natalie said, it's like, I'm glad that I didn't find it at 16 because I'd be working for an airline. And yes, that's an amazing career. And I think that'd be so cool too. 
to have found it earlier. But at the same time, I've really enjoyed the path that I've been and, you know, the struggles, but also finding out what fulfills you, what makes you happy. And my career is amazing and pays for me flying. But um, at the end, at the end of my road, I'm probably going to be flying longer than I do here. When we transition, transitioning careers into aviation is something very unique that I think more and more people are doing, especially as we reach more women, we may not be getting to all of them very early. They may be changing, switching a career. And there is nothing wrong with that. You know, you are you are a unique person. And personally, I think my experience as a wildlife biologist does is a great dovetail with aviation. And it makes me unique. It makes that country charter flying something that it fits me and it speaks to my soul. And I think that's great. I don't think there's anything wrong with just going the traditional route, but I'm just a non-traditional, unconventional person in general. So yeah. I think so too. Yeah. I think we're all like a little bit different in our own ways. And I think that's what's awesome about like connecting with other female pilots for sure. Yeah, yeah. true. So tell me, um, I've got some questions written down here and I'm going to start asking you. Okay. Um, and I want to know what, other than finances, I guess, what would have been your biggest challenge throughout your training? Or is there a particular writing that was really challenging for you? No, what what was most challenging, I think, was was myself and getting out of my own way. I think that's truly what it was. I'd even hold myself back. Um, I was ready for check rides before... Um, I gave myself permission to be ready. I, yeah, I was holding myself back. Um, yeah. The confidence, comp- you know, yeah. Yeah. Did and that get easier you, with each writing? No, I think it got easier as, as more people, more instructors and mentors kept believing in me. And I saw that because we've, at one time or another, we will all encounter someone in aviation that may knock us down a rung, and that happened to me, and um, it was difficult to get through, and it, it did a number on my confidence, and, um, you know, it was nothing I could control. It's just someone's personality, but it really knocked me down, and it just needed some time after that and people to keep believing in me, and you know, you get on a roll, you just, you knock, I knocked out instrument. All right, I'm ready. Let's do commercial and flying my airplane. And, but yeah, that you just have to believe in yourself and get out of your own way. Yeah. So it comes down to. Yeah. Did you have anyone in particular that uh, was a real, real mentor that really had an impact on you and helping you get you through? Yeah. Um, you know, initially coming back, to, into the game after a year of not flying, there was a tailwheel instructor down where uh, we moved, uh, Todd Givens, and he tailwheel aerobatics, he does ferry flying as well. And he was just a great guy, but very gentle. And I've never had so much fun in a cockpit than flying with that man. He, mm-hmm. His laughter is just infectious. And so I did a lot of my cross countries with him, um, I was actually flying with him when my throttle cable broke on the 170 I was flying, and it was the it was the first time I was flying a 170, and in that oh airport. gosh, and oh. I, I was coming in the land, and I'm like, I'm gonna keep it high because compared to my 140, it feels like a heavy airplane. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm coming in, and I'm like, all right, I'm on glide, you know, basically on glide path. Oh, wait, I'm a little lower. I need some power. Well, I went to put in a little power, and nothing happened. And oh. I'm like, no. Oh, and no. So I put in a little more, and nothing happened again. And we made the runway, and we did. Um, we worked together as a crew very well. Um, fixed it, went, came back, no, no problems. But after we fixed it, and we were at that airport, um, I got back in the airplane and the seat track I had put all the way forward or back. I don't remember. Yeah. Well, long story short, I completely fell over back into the, the back seat. Oh, my gosh. 
<laughs> so my legs are, you know, <laughs> oh my gosh. me after all of that stress with the throttle cable breaking yeah. up and everything. And he just starts laughing. And I'm like, That's it would hilarious. be nice if you helped me up. But that yeah. was great. And him being a mentor and so many mentors, the good, the CFIs that got me through, you know, Harrison, Stephen, Brett, all of them. I'm, and my husband, of course, I mean, him being a pilot, I think that that support is, is incredible. No, I don't think anyone else would suffer through me. <laughs> I think you kind of have to have um, experiences, especially if you're going to be a CFI, some bad experiences with CFIs and some good ones. So you kind of learn, okay, I don't want to do this. Right. I know how this met this CFI made me feel. So I want to make sure I don't do that when I have a student going forward. So it's kind of, yeah, it's good. I honestly, yes. I honestly, I've, I've really only had two instructors besides a few people that have helped me, but two instructors and my first instructor, great instructor. I passed my check ride first time, not a big deal, but he was so laid back and chill, you know, mm-hmm. and it was like, great, but then I realized with my next instructor, I, I was like, he was holding me more accountable for things. And I really appreciated that as well. But you definitely do like have a huge difference in instructors and know what you like and don't like once you have a few people that you fly with. And I'm kind of that girl that doesn't like to be told what to do. So, yeah. <laughs> so it was like, you have to take what they are saying to, you know, your application but at the same time like yeah i wonder if that's a common denominator for the females that are in aviation <laughs> because i don't like to be told what to do either yeah. <laughs> nobody is going to tell me what to do I'm gonna yeah. Do my way. I, yeah i think you might be on to something there yeah. Um, yeah yeah i agree with i agree with both of you and i think um also that you know we learn hazardous attitudes during flight training and we teach them to our students as things to watch out in ourselves. But I think it's also very important that we watch out for those hazardous attitudes with instructors and also with the crew who we fly with. Yeah. Um, And that's also what it taught me. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So tell me what, um, I'm going to assume your favorite aircraft that you fly is your 140. Is that right? If I were to ask you your favorite aircraft that you fly. Hmm. Hmm. I didn't know that was going to be difficult. (laughs) You know, it's hard because I love aerobatics so much and I wish I could do aerobatics in my 140. So, you know, I guess I would say my 140 because it's mine, but also a super decathlon. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What about you, Alyssa? You have a favorite that you've flown? Ones that I've flown. I mean, I find I've flown a lot of cool airplanes with people, but I honestly I'm really hooked on the Scout. Um, I flew yeah. trip back from Idaho, and although it's not aerobatic, um, I never considered a tailwheel tandem airplane um, a, a cross country yeah. um, airplane. <laughs> And I find it way more comfortable in the Scout than I do, like, a uh, Cherokee. And um, I might have to pack a little lighter, but the range of a Scout is incredible to me and not having to stop for fuel. And, um, yeah, I just love oh. the Scout. And yeah. American Champion has done something right. So mm-hmm. Cool. I agree. What about you, Natalie? Oh, gosh. Um, I guess. I mean, not the not the people you want. I mean, <laughs> well, I didn't actually Dallas. fly that, so I can't say that. I mean, I flew it for a, a minute or two, but no, um, that I would actually be qualified to fly. I guess I would say I really enjoyed flying the Cub because it was so different. I think, um, and I just felt so like when I was training, it was really nice weather, and we would have like the door open and the window open, th- and so it was like I was just. I just felt so like free and just out yeah. there, you know, I'm not confined at all. The wind blowing through and it was, it was cool. I take it back now. I'm thinking about the J3 on floats at um, Jack Brown's. I mean, that was <laughs> the funnest I've ever flown in an airplane in my entire life. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Okay, so if you um, if you had to give advice to someone, um, a, another female, let's say that she is she just graduated college and she got her business degree and she doesn't really want to do that and she's thinking about maybe flight training, what would you say to her? Has she flown yet? She should take no. a discovery flight. She should take a discovery flight. See how she likes it. You know, you can only try and see if it fits you, but I do have, so that sort of reminds me of something that I read the other day, and I actually have it right here. Do you have time for a quote that's maybe like two sentences long? Sure, yeah. It's beautiful, and I just think it speaks to to so much of what we do and potentially for, for that young girl as well. So it says... Um, a master in the art of living draws no sharp distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his, his education and his recreation. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence through whatever he's doing and leaves others to determine if he's working or playing. To himself, he always seems to be doing both. And so I think that's really cool that you know, it, you don't necessarily have to only work doing something that brings the money in. You kind of want to really be in tune and loving what you do. Like, right. Alyssa, you love making people feel beautiful and doing hair, and that's incredible. And I love when I can get a very difficult population genetics concept through to someone who is struggling. You know, those are... Those are important things. So I would just say to that person, do a discovery flight, uh, maybe do a couple of them and try it out or just go flying with someone and don't ever let the joy get out of it. Don't yeah. let the joy get out. Yeah. So I raised my arm there and I'm sure you guys are like, what is she eating? I know. I was like, what is going on? Podcast? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I legit had like goosebumps twice. Oh. Saying that. Like, I'm like, oh. oh my gosh. Like it's, it's, it's so true. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. So paint a picture of your life in five years. What would you be doing? What would it look like? Oh my goodness. Well, Hmm. In five years, I will hopefully be instructing. Hopefully, I'll have another airplane, too. So maybe a super decathlon or a 195 or... Ooh, girl. Yeah. <laughs> you said scout, and I'm like, ooh, that might be my favorite, too. But <laughs> airplane. Um so yeah, we just all need, maybe we'll all have a business together or we'll be flying with each other. That would be incredible. That would uh, be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, I would be out somewhere remote, hopefully, um, maybe doing some backcountry flying and maybe a little research too. Who knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. If you could fly, fly any airplane, what would it be? If I could fly any airplane? Oh, I'm going to steal my husband's on this one, the Pilatus Porter, the PC6. Hey, yeah. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah, I think I'd really love to do that. I, you yeah. know, and one thing that just, there are so many different things we can do with flying. I would like to be a skydiver pilot for a little bit, too. That'd be I think fun, that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, just for a while. Yeah. I'm, I'm really fascinated with people doing towing. Um <laughs> banners and things like have you ever sat and watched them pick it up and that I have not but I can me. imagine that's got to be pretty complicated go we'll watch a video cool. on it it's so cool and I'm like what that's so insane <laughs> like it's, it's and it's slow and slow right yeah. yeah right I mean you're kind of right on the edge right of getting ready to stall pretty much right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it sounds very interesting okay so let's see did you have any fears when you started flight training? What would have been your biggest fear, do you think, when you started flight training? Did I have any fears? Um, my my biggest fear was that I would not be able to learn how to land. Mm. That was my biggest fear. Yeah. And um, I didn't have any fear of the air or, or anything like that. Um, 
No, really no fears, but but one thing that I've realized over the years and, and flying for, for many years is um, not to let my, to be chill, like Alyssa was saying with the one instructor that was very laid back when I'm instructing, if we're practicing stall de- demos, stall recoveries, spins, those things I'm comfortable doing, but to always stay comfortable because I don't want my students to have fear and I, I don't ever want to contribute to to that inadvertently. Mm-hmm. You know, no, no, no fears. Um, that was my release. That was the thing that I didn't have fear. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. OK. Anything else that you would want to share about your flying or anything you learned or anything particular that you re- really would like to share? To all the millions of subscribers we're going to have. All the millions. You know, we laugh, but you probably will have millions of subscribers. Um, No, but I would... Your word, Kimberly. (laughs) No. Um, I would say to, you know, there's a lot of amazing things in aviation that are going on now, but also look back, um, you know, a hundred years ago or, or whatever, well, maybe not that long, but you know, 50 years ago, 70 years ago and, and do some research on the flying back then. You can learn a lot about that one book that always, um, was in my head that really inspired me was West with the night by Beryl Markham. I don't know. Yeah, I've read that. Yeah. You have read that, but you know, she, she, um, lived in Kenya from about four or five years old working with horses and I used to raise horses and then flying and doing a lot of flying across the African continent and later the Atlantic and you know just taking the time to read about the history of aviation and some of the the cool people that have paved the way for what we're able to do now um, is really important so yeah yeah. you know my son and I went to see um, that movie 1917 yesterday yeah. Yeah. and it was interesting to see because they had like some biplanes you know flying and I, I was thinking gosh I mean aviation really changed war you know and and that just changed so much to do with war and and advancing and things and I thought wow that's just so interesting if that had not come to be how different it would be that's true that's yeah. true yeah yeah, yeah. So, okay. Well, Alyssa, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, no, I think we got to know her pretty well. And yeah. I, I mean, I think it's really awesome what you're doing and I uh, hope to keep following your journey along and hopefully um, we can all hang out sometime. It'd be super fun. I know. I know. Are you going to be going to the um, Women in Aviation Conference, Kimberly? Most likely, um, I don't know. I'm still, I'm still waiting. I, we are just starting our semester up right now, so it depends how how lectures and labs go. I'm yeah. hoping to to get make some good progress with CFI and double I. My my mm-hmm. written for double I expires in August. So oh I'm goodness, not. you gotta get that done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Kimberly. That yeah, was really you. fun. I enjoyed thanks, catching up with you again. Thanks to your husband for the little pop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. well, it was great to meet you, Natalie. It was so good to catch up. It was. Yeah, I enjoyed it. All right. We'll see you later. All right. Let me know if you're ever in South Carolina, okay? I will. I love I'll South Carolina. Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. <laughs> bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Kim Metris. She's uh, a very fun person and super intelligent, driven. I know that she's going to go far, and I can't wait to get over there and see her in Greenville, South Carolina. Hopefully, pretty soon, we'll be able to go flying together. She can probably teach me some aerobatics, because that's on my bucket list, too. So, thanks, Kim. Good luck. I can't wait to catch up with you again soon. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Cockpits and Cocktails. That's such a mouthful, isn't it? I'm looking forward to the next episode, which I already know what that's going to be. It's going to be really exciting. So make sure you tune in and subscribe if you have not. I would really appreciate that, and I know Alyssa would as well. And let us know if there's a topic you'd want us to 
discuss or if there's someone you'd like for us to invite on the show, that would be great. All right. Thanks for listening. Bye.